want to talk about nutrition for muscle. There is this, when I was in medical school, there was this sort of, I don't know if it was the same when you were in medical school, but this sort of subtle brainwashing. Subtle. Oh, it's still, it's still happening. (laughs) It's still happening. It probably is that humans just become decrepit. And it's not our fault that our blood pressure rises as we age, um, that we become more insulin resistant as we age. And, And we mentioned this earlier that perhaps that insulin resistance is due to less movement. But I also would, I really believe strongly that all of these things are due to dietary accumulation of garbage as we age. And this is, I think people will look at professional athletes and say, how can diet be important for muscle health or health of humans when the best athletes on the planet eat McDonald's and chicken nuggets? And my answer is, well, give them 10 years and see what they look like because it accumulates. And I think that there is a tipping point for most of us. And the takeaway that I get from this is, hey, look, uh, seed oils are not benign and the accumulation of excess linoleic acid in the mitochondrial membranes of muscles or any tissue in the body probably also contributes to worsening insulin resistance as we age. And it's just, it's wild to me that Western medicine doesn't have this awareness and that it's just this kind of, I don't know, this kind of, uh, just this default, like, Hey, your patients are going to get more obese. They're going to get weaker. They're going to get more chronically ill as they age and good for you. We have these wonderful medications for you to give them. (laughs) And there's no discussion of like how we avoid that. So how, do you think someone can best support their muscles nutritionally? Like what do we need to put in our bodies to support this organ? Well, I want to frame this. Uh, I don't know if I've ever told you this story. Did I ever tell you about some of the the research that I did when I was at WashU? No. Where these concepts came from? I'm going to frame it for you because it actually piggybacks lovely uh, off of what you're saying. I did two years of geriatric training and I actually didn't want to do it. The deal was, I mean, no surprise, right? End of life, very depressing, working in the hospital. You know it, right? You did it for a period of time before you did psychiatry, you did cardiology. And it is not a beautiful place to be. It is heart-wrenching. I wanted to go back. So I did an undergraduate in nutritional sciences. And then I wanted to go back and do a fellowship in nutrition. In order to do a fellowship in nutritional sciences and not just have it be medical, I had to get funding. The way that I was going to get funding was I agreed to be a geriatric fellow. So I had a dual role as a geriatric fellow, which is an individual who takes care of individuals over the age of 65. My role transitioned through nursing homes on the weekend, dementia clinics, um, palliative care, which is end of life, and and so on. Very stroke ward, just all of it. Very, very, very depressing. In the evenings and the early mornings, I did obesity medicine research. And one of the studies that we were working on at the time was looking at body composition and brain volume. This one participant, we'll just call her Betty, she is the picture of the majority of 50-some-year-old women that we see today. She was a mom of three. She had cycled through years of losing the same 10 to 20 pounds. The medical community had given the advice to eat less, exercise more, do Weight Watchers, continue to restrict your calories. When we imaged her brain, her brain looked like the beginning of an Alzheimer's brain. Hmm. And it was at that moment I felt... Uh, I mean, you know how it is. There's always a one patient that you really connect with and you just love and you don't want to see anything. I mean, you feel that way about all your patients, but there was this just, she pulled at a a heartstring and we failed her. Uh, We failed her. The medical community had failed her. She had done everything that she was told to do. She ate less. She exercised more. And in the process, Over and over, year after year, she totally destroyed her skeletal muscle. Her body fat was easily 35% with very little skeletal muscle. She had issues with blood sugar regulation, insulin, triglycerides, all of the things that you would imagine were to happen. The thing is, is no one had given her any advice to improve her skeletal muscle, which is at the core of these issues. Skeletal muscle is, is just the focal point to do resistance training, 
and to improve the quality and nutrient density of our food with high quality proteins. And I feel that we just totally destroyed her life. And then I started to think, what is the one thing that all these sick patients have in common? And quite frankly, it wasn't obesity. It wasn't that they were over fat. These patients with dementia and these patients with other disease processes, what they had was they didn't have enough skeletal muscle. They had unhealthy skeletal muscle. And that's where muscle-centric medicine came from. Uh, I just wanted to share that because it, it really does piggyback to what you're saying is, number one, framing why is skeletal muscle so important, and we've completely missed the boat. And in fact, we don't even measure it directly, by the way. When you get a DEXA, DEXA is body fat percentage. You're laughing, you're laughing because you know yeah, yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. And you can recognize that we've built a foundation of information and knowledge on the shoulders of things that are surrogate markers. And when you do that, inevitably, there is going to be a shift a change in paradigm when we begin to directly measure this tissue, which is actually what is going to happen through something called a D3 creatine. It's a, it's a deuterated creatine. It's tagged creatine. where you are going to take a pill and you're going to be able to see how much muscle mass you have. It's mm. going to be a urinary test. You're going to be able to see how much muscle mass. And for the astute listener, you're going to think, we were talking about muscle mass and strength. The literature, the large body of literature would suggest that mass doesn't matter, which doesn't make any cognitive sense. The idea that skeletal mass doesn't matter, that it's all strength, that really it's about strength. And my argument would be, well, we haven't been measuring it directly. And what we're starting to see is as soon as we begin measuring skeletal muscle directly, then yes, there is a relationship between skeletal muscle mass and strength. And actually the loss of skeletal muscle is more impactful than the gain of body fat as we age. And that's... That's something that can't be emphasized enough. That's essentially sarcopenia, right? Yeah, it is sarcopenia, yes. Which is a term, in case people are not familiar, help us understand what sarcopenia is. Are you ready for this? Are you ready to have your mind blown? Well, maybe Always. everybody else, everyone else maybe have their mind blown. The International Classification for Disease, which if you're a physician listening to this, you know that this is the ICD-10 code. Sarcopenia is the loss of skeletal muscle mass and function. It's believed to be about 1% per decade after 50 years. I believe uh, that it is higher, and I believe that it starts much earlier. I believe it starts in your 30s if you are inactive, just like heart disease and Alzheimer's. The ICD-10 code for sarcopenia to recognize it as a disease was 2016. Tell me that isn't mind-blowing. It, it didn't exist before the last few years. <laughs> it wasn't recognized as a disease. And, and I want to highlight something else, that if you look at the uh, causes of uh, mortality, so the number of deaths for, um, according to the CDC, you have heart, the top causes of death, heart disease, cancer, accidents, stroke, uh, chronic lower respiratory diseases, uh, diabetes, Alzheimer's, et cetera. Nowhere on that list will you see loss of skeletal muscle or sarcopenia, as well as obesity. You don't even see that on the list. Skeletal muscle is directly related for all of those that I listed, if not the root cause. So in some ways, just like Alzheimer's disease is a loss of neurons in certain parts of the brain, the substantia nigra, these dopaminergic nerves in the brain, would you characterize a lot of the chronic disease we have as a loss of muscle? And no one is really thinking about it this way. Like we're losing critical things for the body, just like neurons are critical. A brain, we're, we're losing muscle with sarcopenia here. I, I would say that when we think about what are the things that actually kill us from a metabolic perspective, the root cause is skeletal muscle. And again, so, there's many yeah. mechanisms, whether it's is it an insulin resistance? Is it ceramides? Is it a mitochondrial dysfunction? Is it a receptor issue? I mean, there could be a million different, you just Google, you know, causes of, uh, I don't know, pathology and skeletal muscle. You'll find a, a million, right? I, I don't know if anyone has decided on what the overarching factor is, but one thing is for sure, it is the one tissue that you can do something about. An exercised, well-trained skeletal muscle is healthy skeletal muscle. So what do you think is causing the muscle loss? Like all the, you know, like sometimes 
the research landscape is frustrating for me because randomized controlled trials are super valuable. And sometimes if we don't have them, we have to use our intuition and think as humans. What's your suspicion as a physician, as a clinician, of what is going on with sarcopenia, this loss of this critical endocrine, immunologic organ in the body? Why are we losing this? Why is my mom losing this? Why is my dad losing this? Just like the loss of neurons in the brain with Alzheimer's or dementias or neurodegenerative diseases, we essentially have musculoskeletal, we have muscular degenerative diseases as humans. Like, what do you think is going on? It's just a, what, what do you believe, what do you suspect as a physician is going on? When I think about the hallmarks of aging, I think about uh, protein turnover and proteostasis. And I believe that we are not able to keep up with the lifestyle. So humans are largely domesticated. This is a Western disease. This is not a disease that I believe has to happen, by the way. What I believe is happening is twofold. Our nutrition as we age is totally off base. Uh, It starts young, habits start young. We do not keep up with our changing physiology. And the balance between exercise and movement and nutrition changes. When we're younger, again, you could have done bicep curls in college and you probably were eating some Twinkies or something else and you were still able to put on muscle. Let's be frank, okay? You were able to do all those things. Whether you got eczema or psoriasis or whatever it is, you were able to do a lot of things that potentially wouldn't be healthy and you still probably looked great. As individuals age, that wave of youth closes the capacity to leverage the youthful hormones, to leverage the body's plasticity while the window never completely closes until uh, it's over, the ability to push hard enough to stimulate that tissue uh, becomes more challenging. I believe that we are under eating dietary protein. I believe that we are eating too low of a nutrient-dense diet from an iron standpoint, from a B12 standpoint, from all these nutrients that we need. And we are not pushing our bodies hard enough. We are deeply domesticated. And then you throw in some low-level inflammation. You throw in some shitty food. You throw in lack of sleep, which also suppresses. There's there's a, I was talking to one of the researchers out of Galveston and a one night of sleep restriction might affect muscle protein synthesis by 18%. Wow. One night. Crazy. Um, and that's what I think is happening. And the other thing is the nutrition landscape is never empirical. It's never an empirical conversation. It is a conversation that is wrapped with politics, that's wrapped with morality, wrapped with things all related to other aspects than actually the data. 